for the breaking transmission. It was due to some technical faults here in the studio. But it's good to be with you again on Summit. My name is Jumoke Michaels. Banji. The devil is a liar. We are going to have a great show today. Yes. My name is Banji Busari. It's the fresh edition of the program, the midweek edition. And I can really assure you that you're going to take away so much from this program today. You're welcome. All right, so on the program today, we'll be looking at two very interesting and uh, very relevant topics. Uh, the first one is Nigeria at 61, the journey so far. And the second one is towards the 2023 controversy over zoning. Friday is the 1st of October, and Nigeria will be celebrating its 30, 61st independence anniversary. So we're going to be looking at the, uh, well, the future of Nigeria uh, even at 61. And we have joining us this morning the convener of Country First Movement, Professor Chris Mwokobia. You're welcome, sir. It's my pleasure to be here. Good to have you join us. Uh, you know, I actually teased that I said that Abuja has finally released our guest because uh, <laughs> for weeks he's been in Abuja. Uh, media men have actually been calling, but uh, yielded to our invitation this time around. So we are very grateful to, to have you here. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, just as Jumoke said, in the next uh, 48 hours, will be, Nigeria will be celebrating 61 years of its independence. Uh, that's a long way, uh, uh, Prof. Um, don't forget that Nigeria has been described variously by several people. In the past, it was described as the giant in the sun. Uh, but these days, you hear uh, giant with, uh, I mean, crippled giant, giant with clay legs. <laughs> And so many other, I mean, unpleasant uh, adjectives and all that. But irrespective of all that, the vice president on Sunday said, uh, we have not lost focus as a nation, that the Nigeria is still very much on course as far as its vision or the vision of the founding fathers. Are we truly on the course of the, uh, the, the vision of the founding fathers at 61? Let me say, frankly, that uh, personally, I have amazing faith in Nigeria. Uh, deeply so, because uh, across the world, and if you were to have an idea of what numbers and metaphysics would say about countries like ours, uh, you will understand where I'm coming from. The first thing is uh, the Christian scriptures, the Bible says that the cord of two is strong, the cord of three who can break. And then across uh, global history, uh, every nation that is a cord of three has been able to manage these contradictions and then emerge out of the nada, a better state, a better country. I'll give you a graphic instance. Um, South Africa here, years of apartheid, you have a cut of three, the blacks, the Africans, and the whites. And then you have um, the United Kingdom, blacks, white, and uh, the Saxons, the aborigines. And then you have um, the United States, the aborigines, that's the Red Indians, the people they call the Red Indians, the blacks, and the settlers, the colored people who came as pilgrims from the United Kingdom. You have Australia, the Australoids, the black and the whites. And um, uh, you have Switzerland. You have several countries that have been able to go through the contradictions of, uh, of its uh, uh, historicity and emerge stronger and better. And then Nigeria is not just a code of three. Nigeria is a super code of three threes. That makes it unique. You have, if you were to look at our map, you see the big knot the south, former southeast, so to say, and then the southwest. Our map gives you three regions, three unique regions. And then you have three ethnic, major ethnic uh, tendencies, the Yorubas, the Igbos, and the Aousas. And then you have three uh, religious tendencies, the Christian faith, the Muslim faith, and the traditional work path. And I... Maybe that's why we have our major problems. But like the Vice President said on Sunday, the day we wake up to the fact that the things that unite us 
are bigger than the things that divide us. The day we wake up to the reality of the fact that the Nigerian state can form a rainbow coalition of sorts and take Africa, if you like, to the front of the new world, the day we realize that uh, though our tongues may differ, we truly can stand in brotherhood, the day we realize that uh, we must look away from the preachments and the demagoguery of political operators and understand that outside where our collective teal is shared, uh, that's where they come to us to tell us about our Ibo-ness, our, our Yoruba-ness, our Hausa-ness and the likes. When they are in the room, in the coven, if you like, in the parlor, if you like, where our collective teal is in disputation, in debate, they are united. You don't have when they truly want to share our collective patrimony. You don't have Ibo's, Yoruba's, Hausa, you have political operators. They are united in a collective mission to do perhaps the service to our country. But now, I, I believe that after 61 years of nationhood, uh, I'd rather call Nigeria a great potential, but as it realistically is, uh, is a big infant that has refused to fulfill her promises. Remember, in the year I was born, Malaysia came to take palm oil seedlings from Nigeria. Today, Malaysia makes over $5 billion exporting palm oil to Nigeria. I'm talking about 1971. Then, look at our potential. The population of about 200 million people. China has used its population for great progress. Even Indonesia. Malaysia, India. And so what should otherwise be our blessing if we were to have leadership that's proactive and progressive has, if you like, become some kind of cause? And then talk about the humongous world we've made from oil since 1958. What have we done with it? Talk about uh, our young people you know why we're having security today? It's not necessarily the failure of the President Watch. It's the product of a failure of successive leadership. Uh, my late dad told me before he passed on in 2003 that uh, we live in a country that has progressively sown bad seeds. Sour bean. Evil bean. And that this nation, if care is not taken, will in the coming years reap a harvest of rashes. Today, with benefit of hindsight, the children will refuse to school in the name of our Marjorie kids. The children will refuse to school in the name of no funds have become the problem with the present uh, enterprise called Nigeria. You, you, some give them names that perhaps uh, fit uh, political environments and temperaments. They say bandits, they say some are rustlers, they say some are kidnappers, some are hijackers. They are come, but what we know is that the scene we saw yesterday has emerged as monstrous and monumental criminality everywhere. And so what must we do? Our country can solve the contradictions. Before we actually talk about the solution, uh, 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 the, 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 the mentioned it, that we are looking at in 61 years. Can we really point out maybe one or two achievements that we have made uh, that has uh, put us on the world map? And we can say, oh, as a nation, we have also registered our presence. And work. So what, are there things we can, for instance, we have the population. Is it something we can say it's to our advantage? If there are achievements. Um Banji, Nigerians are doing profound everywhere in the world. I, I do not want to be conscripted to naming, but individually Nigerians are excellent. The Nigerian community in the U.S. is the most educated migrant community in the, in the U.S. The, the Nigerian family, the Imafidons, are the most intelligent family in the United Kingdom. 
Nigerians are doing profound. In sports, Nigerians have done pretty well. Records have been broken over the years. Uh, we've won the Olympic gold. We've done a few things uh, profound. In science, Banji, yeah, we may say it's an individual, but the father of the internet today, still the same Nigerian kid from Onicha, uh, Philip Emawali, who by every dint of, uh, looks like me, <laughs> you know, and then uh, he, he is the father of the internet. He's built the supercomputer. The father of modern mathematics, Gabriel Oyibo, I think is from Kogi State. You know, uh, you have Nigerians who have excelled in several fields of human endeavors. And then as a country, I, I would be a bit uh, comical, but the truth is we're broken records in the negative and in the positive. Um, in the negative, they said the marauding uh, headsman. I, I do not want to call them Fulani because uh, you have fantastic Fulanese as well as bad Fulanese. The way you have fantastic Yorubas as well as bad Yorubas, fantastic Aousas, bad Aousas, fantastic Ibos, bad Ibos everywhere. So I'd rather say the marauding headsman are re recorded as, I think, the fourth deadliest terrorist group in the world. Then uh, there's another group, Boko Haram and Iswap Africa, about the top deadliest terrorist group in the world. And so uh, we've broken records in the negative. The same way, like I noted, we've broken records, records in the positive. We have experts, and if you were to go to the Silicon Valley, uh, uh, where most of these ITs are churned out in the United States of America, it is believed and reported as such that over 30% of the backroom stars who make these ICs, who make these facilities and turn the world into a beautiful place are Nigerians. And so I, I think that what is important now is for our leadership and those who truly care about this country to begin to galvanize. Um, rather than agonize, we must begin to identify these great Nigerians, engage them effectively. That's what Singapore did. That's what Taiwan in China is doing. That's what several other countries, even Cote d'Ivoire here, you know, engage your best hands in not necessarily politics, but ensuring that away from a consumptive country, we become a productive country. Because the way to, to grow a nation is not necessarily, like my big brother, Patu Tommy, would say, uh, it's not necessarily about harvesting revenues everywhere. It's about production. We must think about how we, our farms sprout again, how we can return to one of the best producers of cocoa in the world. Because the whole of the Southwest, if we were to go into historicity, the biggest building in Africa at some point was the cocoa house in the bottom, built from wealth uh, from cocoa in the Southwest. Remember also that even the state of Northern Ireland and France did not have television before the former Western region. And it was resources made from cocoa. You know, I, I think that the time has come for those who operate at uh, the highest level of leadership to understand that uh, beyond politics and politicking, the challenge to redeem our country and make it truly great again is, is, is before all of us. What about issues of uh, this um, divisiveness? We are so divided. Like you said, one of the lines of the national anthem when we started talking, say that, uh, Though tribes and talks may differ, in brotherhood we stand. And you know, because of this uh, divisiveness, many people have said that we are not a nation, that we still operate as a country, because um, we are so divided, especially in recent times. It's said that um, Nigeria has not been this divided as we are now. Looking, at the, looking for a solution to these issues of divisiveness, and that's why we are saying, uh, the president should come from the north or the president should come from the south is also because we are divided. Is there any solution in sight for this as Nigeria celebrates 60, 61 years of independence? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the way to go first, like I said, is to challenge leadership to proactive and progressive action. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, since I became an adult, I've been confronted by political operators who would rather pander to ethnicity and region rather than competency and capacity. 
and that's the tragedy of our nation. Which of course is what uh, um, informed your question. How can we, how may we unite this country and take away from our political lexicon uh, words and normative like zoning, rotation on ethnic grounds or regional grounds. Uh, I'll make you laugh. We can do that the day we begin to think about competency over your region. The day we begin to think about capacity over religion. The day we begin to think about the things that unite us. And also remember that hunger is indiscriminate of your tribe or religion. Also remember that illiteracy is indiscriminate of where you are from. Also remember that insecurity, the day will remember that insecurity is mindless of whether you're Yoruba, Igbo, Aousa. When the marauders, when the headsmen, when the bandits strike, they do not identify who is Igbo, Yoruba, or Aousa. They do their havoc. You know, so I, I think that the time has come for us to understand. I, I, I was teasing somebody yesterday. I said to him, my friend, you think that if power were to come to the southeast, it would solve our problems? And then he looked at me. He said, but let it just come, so that it gives us a sense of belonging. And I said, how does it just come in, solve our problems? For most of our historicity, power has been in the north. The highest number of out-of-school kids in Nigeria is in the north. We dwarf every history across the globe, even Rural India has more educated kids than we do have in the north. And that was why the former emir, the one that was deposed, was Amida, crying Amida wolf, Sanusi. Lamido Sanusi. He said, if we continue like this, we're going to hurt ourselves fatally. And that's what's happening today. Bandits are running amok in Zamfara, in Katsina, across the north. And what did power do for them? And then you ask yourself, we have a brother of ours who was president from the South South, Goodrock, a village in Atan. I'm aware that the road to his hometown is as decrepit as the one to my hometown. Uh, I'm aware that uh, that is why so many people in his home state of Bayasa do not seem to defer to him so much. I'm also aware that uh, the former President of our Federal Republic uh, from the Southwest, Chief Olusheka of Basanjo, uh, is not so very well loved in the Southwest because they said that for eight years he was in power, he didn't do so much with it. So I, I don't think that our challenge should be about the ethnicity of our president. Uh, Banji, the Jews practically run the American economy. I can't. If I tax you to name an American Jew who has been president of America, you just may not be able to name one. Uh, what they have come to realize is that uh, the man who runs the show must be made accountable to the people. That's chiefly what it should be. And it must be a man who's passionate. Uh, for me, those who are calling for zoning, I'm opposed to zoning for three strong reasons. And it's important, and I'm happy, if you like, uh, lucky that I have this platform to say this. I'm grooming a son I call King. What if tomorrow he becomes just about the best of his generation? And if for any reason somebody from my hometown or from my region becomes president, and after 20 years they say to this character that is so formed to outperform me that your people have produced a president before so you can't be president. How unfair would that be to learning and competency? I live in a country where I've seen young men who are doing profound. So if perhaps that young man is from the Southwest and he loves his country more than everybody does, speaking deeply, and he's ready to lay down his life for his country, just because there was a certain president, Lucia Gobasanjo, he loses the right to become president. I don't, because we want to solve one injustice, advocate the etching on our collective canvas of another injustice. That's point number two. And then point number three, yes, some have said that every region in this country has competent hands. No disputation. 
But competency cannot be measured that way. Leadership, like Mitt Romney said, must be about showing the way. What if across the country there's one little boy from uh, Ogoniland, or perhaps another young man from Kogi State who believes that he can do it? And then because there's a certain zoning normative, he's zoned out. How does it help Nigeria? So I think that those who are dissatisfied with the, the happenings around our country should push, like I'm pushing, for a dialogue of some sort, rather than thinning down the political space because you think it is time for an Igbo president. Who says it's time for a Yoruba president? Who says it's time for an Aousa president? I want to see a Nigerian president who is competent, who has capacity, who loves our country, and who is ready to work on our electricity energy, who is ready to dispassionately work on education, who is ready to tackle the challenges of security, who is ready to make gender equity and gender inclusiveness part of his trump card, who is ready to make the Nigerian, the green, white, green, uh, a major source of pride and who's able and ready to make the ego soar again. And I think that should be the major basis for engagement as 2023 approaches. Okay. Uh, uh, so many issues, uh, Prof. Um, so many problems have actually been identified as the reason why we're still where we are 61 years after independence. But would you not actually, some people say it's majorly constitutionally based that our problem actually stemmed or started from the wrong constitution that is, uh, this nation is guided by. So do you think it's just constitutional issues or it goes beyond that? Can we do anything about this constitution that has continually been referred to as the reason for our stunted growth and so many issues? But I think that uh, to look away from a uh, faulty constitution is like wishing that uh, someday an infant male becomes an infant female, just like that. You know, is to wait for Godot. You know, I, I think that the time has come for us to truly, truly address our structure. And the constitution is the chief document that spells out how things must work and the way to go. We talked about briefly here about the First Republic when from Coco, the Southwest was doing profound. When from Heights and Skin, Granot and Sesame, the North was doing awesome. When from Palm Produce, the Old Western and Rubber, the Old Western, uh, uh, Midwestern Nigeria was doing profound. When from Coal and Palm Produce, and agriculture, the old eastern region was doing profound. Um, when we threw away the constitution that gave us some semblance of true fiscal federalism, when we threw away the Republican constitution uh, in 1966, January 15th, when those young men who were more, uh, more passionate than realistic who were more uh, excited than, than deep, who were more emotional than patriotic, struck in January and destroyed our democratic uh, fabrics. You know, that was the major beginning of our trouble as a nation, you know, because instead of handling the problem effectively, Iran see through Decree 34, unified Nigeria, created some kind of unitary state that killed every effort to industry, to hard work, and made Nigeria largely rent-seeking and rent-taking, that killed every effort to, to grow in uh, produce and wealth on comparative basis, that killed every effort at hard work, um, unfortunately, I have told my friends that what bothers the carapace of my mind is not so much of that debt, but what successive leaders have done since then. But you know what? 
Successive leadership has been very lazy. Successive leadership has been more interested in revenue rather than creating wealth. Successive leadership has been more interested in quick fixes rather than growing strong values and principles for our nation. And unfortunately, that's why we're where we are. But I believe that my generation, and that's why for me, Banji, I think it's you to clock. I think it is time for young people from the age of 18 to 55, permit my, uh, my, my ratio, to look in the face of our fathers and say, you have done so well, you have done so well. It's been 61 years of uh, trying the same way uh, to solve a common problem, and a problem we all know. Now is the time for us to try young ideas. Now is the time for us to try young people. Now is the time to challenge those who are the major victims of the failure of the Nigerian state to fix that thing. Uh, I believe that if we think along that line, 2023 may just be the beginning of the redemption of our country. Um, the sage of Afama Awolowo once said that um, hope is not something we throw away because hope is the last milk in the human breast. I think that we, we should truly have hope. And then we should believe that together we can redeem our country when we organize, galvanize our strength as a people rather than agonize. All right, thank you, sir, for uh, your contributions in this first topic. We'd like to transit. Uh, 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 please permit me to okay. uh, 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 just, uh, uh, just a, a couple of uh, moments. By, 20, by 2050, Nigeria's population is projected to rise up to by 400 million. Now, and um, already the youth are agonizing. You saw what happened with NSAS last year. Um, do you think, you, in your opening statement, your introductions, you said when, 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 when Nigeria realizes, when Nigeria does this, do you think the youth can afford to wait a bit? Because this population is, keeps growing in a geometric way, whereas the economy is dwindling, we are seeing. And do you think Nigeria will stand by that time? But I remember the last time I was here, I, in no uh, uncertain words, eulogized the young boys and young girls who stood out at Ojota, who stood out at uh, the toll gate here, who stood out at Lekki, demanding for new values and new normative in leadership. I, and thank God you referred to their restlessness. Banji, I sincerely think that for them, they do not want to engage in the luxury of pulling off. They do not have the latitude for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. What we used to, oh, take it easy, take it easy. They're not ready for that anymore. And that's what you saw in the not too young to run bill. Banji, with all sense of humility, I started that movement because in 2011, when I was just before uh, 40 years, I ran for the office of president. I was 40 years, just a few weeks to the election proper, and in tandem with the constitutional provi provision and the electoral act normative at that point. But just after that, uh, you have seen a lot of young people in their late 30s and 40s who are saying, we can rule and govern our country. We can make things better. So I, I do not see young people waiting uh, for too long no more. And that's why I believe that, uh, and this is personal, that in the state of Kogi, a 46-year-old boy, and probably my use of word, he would laugh when he hears me say that, but, but I'm older than him. So has said that he can do it. And then there are a lot of young people who are out there who are saying that they can do it. I think that the time has come for us rather than this continuous uh, tendency of young people painting other young people with black stained brushes. The time has come for us to interrogate our competency and capacity rather than dancing Atlanta, Atilogo, or whatever you have behind the same old people who have been on the political amphitheater for God knows how long, 
The time has come for us to organize and unite and take our country away from the nada to promise. So I believe that nobody's waiting until 2050, nobody's waiting until 2030. The young people are saying that it is youth o'clock. Have you heard that? Youth o'clock. Yes. And then there's another cliche. They are saying it's utocracy. They are saying for so long we have waited for our elders to do the needful. And since it doesn't appear like it's happening now, we are going to take our destinies in our hands. And interestingly, they're not saying they're going to do it violently. Because you saw that in the NSAS protestation. For almost 20 days, the Nigerian young boys and young girls taught the world a lesson in passive resistance, taught the world a lesson in peaceful protest until that day when certain agents provoked conflict and violence. Remember that they were peaceful. They organized their protestation with the highest level of decorum and discipline. And I believe that as we proceed towards 2023, these young men and young women will understand that power is never given. And power is taken. And so we must organize and ask for power, work for power, and take our country away from this jangling discord of poverty, disease, despondency, joblessness, and want to the amazing place of promise. All right, so let me just uh, read this message I have here before we transit to the next topic, even though it's, a little bit, it's already in line with what we're talking about already. This person says, sent a quote, actually, the quote is from Nelson Mandela. He said, uh, when people are determined, they can overcome anything. That's what he said, just a quote. All right, so let's transit to the second topic, which is uh, about 2023 and controversy over Zoom, even though you have already said uh, you gave us three points on where on why you are against zoning and that's uh these arose from the uh, southern governor's um, meeting when they said the presidency should be zoned to the south and we have the northern elders forum and traditional rulers who and have government. come out to say, forum too. Yeah, who have already said no to that that um, it's not about zoning but that um, it should be on rotation of uh, competency capacity and capability of anywhere from Nigeria. Uh, 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 let me add uh, something to that. In addition to I mean, part of I mean, their, their, their resolutions, their spokesperson, that's uh, Dr. Aki Baba Ahmed, has actually said much more than that. That he has actually thrown faces on the faces of the governors, saying that they
Oh, we apologize for that break in transmission, but we are still here in the studio to continue with the discussion talking about uh, the 2023 controversy over zoning. Uh, 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 I, I, I was saying before the light went off that Dr. Akim Baba Ahmed has pointedly told the southern governors and indeed the entire south that the north has the majority of votes when it comes to election and it will not settle for a second position when he knows he has the capacity to be in the first position. Beyond that, he said, whether in the, either the might president or, pres, or vice yes. president, that they have always been in control of administration of this country. How do you see all of this together? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the reason you have uh, bigotry on our space, and probably my use of word, the reason we have that kind of bigotry is simply because the first shot came from the governors from our side of the divide. Oh, you feel it's they said it, they used the word must. Must. I saw it, both in Ibadan and in Enugu, that the next president must come from the south. And uh, the North responded with proclamations as to how they are opposed to zoning. And then Baba Ahmed spoke out of his, uh, probably my use of word, bigotry. And I say that advisedly, because for me, uh, I'd ask Baba Ahmed to, to tell me what census put those figures out. And we, we know that we have a credulous, a disputable, a doubtful, a devious census figures. We know. Because this is the only part of the world where a coastal state has less population than dry lands. This is the only part of the world where, where you have the all over the world, you know, coastal areas have more population than dry lands. But our census normative says, okay, uh, dry land has more population than coastal areas. But that's for another day. What is important as we discuss Nigeria going forward is that we identify, and that's why I said to my friends who care, that I'm one of those who's vehemently opposed to zoning of power, you know. We don't have a constitution that provides like that of Switzerland for uh, the Electoral Council of Presidents, where every year they change the chairman. So you have uh, every of the six major zones, so to say, where the zones producing a president for one year. Now, we don't have that constitutional normative. If we were to have an amended constitution that provides for such collegiate presidency, Perhaps the argument for, okay, the South East should pro produce a president for two years, the North should produce, that can be discussed. But as you and I talk, like I noted, I am looking forward to a country where what should matter is competency and capacity rather than ethnicity and region. And I say this advisedly. Uh, Banji, you noted, and I chuckled when you did, that when you apologize to our viewers, that... Uh, before light, before Nepal, before the electricity power went out. 61 years of nationhood were grappling with that. 61 years of nationhood, the young boy and young girl who's trained in some vocation cannot thrive because he does not have money to power his business. 61 years after, we still have the highest number of out-of-school kids not by reason of our population, but by reason of a failure of successive administration to put primacy on education. 61 years after, we were caught in the debate of religion and region. 61 years after, ethnicity is still the major score in our politics. 61 years after, we sacrifice excellence on the altar of mediocrity. And people are looking at me in the face and saying, oh, power has to go to the southeast. 
or power has to go to the north, I rather will sit down and identify the most competent, the most passionate people, put them through the grilling debate, and then we choose who is the best and who is the most passionate and who is ready to govern this country. I am not one of those who, I will not lend, lend credence to the effort of the governors for governors of the south and the governors of the north to hit our polity. I'm tired of debates and disputations as to ethnicity and religion or region. I'm tired of uh, preaching and ennobling those things that divide us. I'm tired of discussing Nigeria on the altar or the scorecard of my Ibo-ness, your yoruba -ness, or that man's house I want to talk about a country that's able to compete favorably with any ethnicity, any country in the world. I want to talk about a country, Banji, and this will bother you. When I talk about this, my eyes well up with tears. Because if you have about 46, uh, 64 mineral resources in the world that's making huge profit, you have 46 in Nigeria alone. You know, the sage of Bafama Olawon said that God is perhaps very angry with us because he has blessed us with resources and riches in a fable, more than any other nation in the world. And yet our people are hungry and poor. Yet nothing is working, Banji. And who told you that the, the marauding headsmen will be doing what they're doing if successive government had done well and ranching has become like obtains in Brazil, Australia, and several other countries, the way to uh, animal breeding. Who told you that we'll have the number of bandits that we have out there if our children were schooled? So why are we looking away from the major issues? You think it's power in the north has made the north better? Or power coming to the east will make the easterner love himself? Or power coming back to the southwest will make the southwest do better? The records are there. It is the most flawed argument to make. I think at the time for Nigerians to think about competency over, over zoning is now. And we can identify the best of hands. What we need to do is pass them through a grilling mental and intellectual process. The parties should stand up to reality and tell us, oh, this young man is the best we can offer. The other man comes out with this young man is the best we can offer. I'm tired of the debate uh, along the lines of ethnicity, religion. No, no, no. I don't think it's ennobling. I don't think that that is the kind of debate I want my generation to hand over to our children. But you know that this issue even starts from party level, especially before these uh, parties do their primaries. And we have our candidates uh, uh, presented that, okay, this is our candidate. This debate you're talking about, let's talk about, talk about it from the party level. When you want to do your primaries, those who say, I want to come for, I want to, I want to run for presidency, I want to run for governorship, even to the local government, all these issues always uh, show up. But that's why we're from shooting it down. From party level, now. yeah, from party level. That, that's why we, how, we wouldn't let it press How should this anymore. debate begin from party level to choose competent hands? But let me say, interestingly, that I think that one of the reasons this debate is raging now is because, by God's grace, we are increasingly achieving the new uh, tendency of making party leaders understand that in the build up to 2023, things must be done differently. Because uh, remember that, oh, although it hasn't been the practical process, they mount it, uh, by now uh, the PDP would have come out to say we were zoning to so so and so. It may not be effective, but they would say it. Uh, the APC will, will come to say, oh, it has to be this. But now, the two parties are saying, why not? The Uguayan led committee said, zoning is not part of my mandate. We're not discussing zoning. And then in APC, we're saying, we're not discussing zoning. Let the best hands put themselves forward. We will identify the best of all of them and support them. And I think that if the issue be any predilection to uh, reduce and narrow in the space, it should be about young people and women and gender 
and youth is not an ethnic, is not a religious, is not a regional normative. I think young people should say, enough of all these shenanigans. Do you think the highly monetized electoral process will throw up the best candidate in this country? Oh, interestingly, Banji, young people are working harder than you think today. And young people can pull resources together. You know, they, there's a difference between our fathers and us. You know, I, I'll give you a practical instance. Although I'm not ennobling them, remember a certain young man, uh, he was all over the social media, had to bury his mother recently. And the contribution of wealth from young friends made a major news in the social media. Have you noticed that if you were to lose any, maybe your parent or your, what we do as young people on the social media these days, sometimes people are not even scared when they lose a loved one because friends will come together and contribute resources to ensuring that nobody bears the pain alone. That's the generation that we belong to. We know what it means to care for each other. Our parents, this generation of political operators, may not understand that. And in the build up to 2023, we're saying that young people will galvanize. Young people will organize rather than organize. And we'll take our destiny in our hands. We'll take our nation out of the nada to promise. And we'll do that, God on our side. <laughs> This is a very interesting conversation. Because I, I, I didn't research the high, discussion going high, high, high this direction. Yeah, the direction he has, <laughs> maybe he has told us that he's representing a new a generation. A new yeah. generation. So yeah. you shouldn't be surprised to say where he's coming from. Um, Nigeria will be 61 in two days. Your word to the current administration. To Mr. President and uh, our dear Vice President and those who so pretend over our country, I expect on the 1st of October an address that inspires hope. I expect Mr. President to tell Nigerians that though truly our tongues may differ, we can unite and build a country that will break down the walls of injustice, that will break the, down the walls of ethnicity, and that will build a country that truly, truly inspires hope and confidence. I expect Mr. President to reassure Nigerians that the issues of uh, insecurity will be dealt with. He's doing a lot in that direction now. I expect Mr. President to inspire our young people by telling Nigerians that the 2022 budget will have a far greater money allocated to education because we must declare a state of emergency on education. I expect Mr. President and indeed the governors across the country to make a commitment to integrity in governance, to make a commitment against corruption in governance, to make a commitment to new values for our dear country. For only when we change our ways, only when we rework our structure as a nation, only when we tell ourselves the truth and work in line with the challenges of a highly progressive world, can we come out of these dark nights and make the next Independence Day a story better than this? I believe that, like Bafemi Awolo would say, hope is the last milk in the human breast. And so may that hope swap that we build a better country for our children and indeed posterity. God bless Nigeria. God bless Thank you so Nigeria. Much, Thank God you so Nigeria. much, sir. Our guest is the convener, Country First Movement, Professor Chris Nwakobi. Thank you, sir. Thank and you, that's sir. our program today. We'll see you again on Monday for another interesting edition. My name is Jumoke. My guest. See you. Yeah, we can't thank you enough, Prof, God bless for your you words, God. for your thoughts, and everything you have said on this program. Thank you. Very, very grateful, sir. God bless you. We look forward to Nigeria of our dreams. Yes. My name is Banji Busari. See you again on Monday.